Well, I want to start tonight by reiterating something that I, I, I probably have said before, uh, and if I haven't said it, said it enough, um, let's remedy that. And that is that you know, my, my whole purpose in design is to see your heart established in grace. And I realize that there is such an overwhelming amount of influence that's coming from this world, from this dimension. I know that sounds real sci-fi, but I'll try to explain as I go. That's working and pressing against us. Uh, What I mean by this dimension is I, I think as believers, we reside and rest in the kingdom and we receive our information through the through, the, through our hearts, through the Holy Spirit, what Paul said in, to the Corinthians, that we have not been given the spirit of this, of this world, but we've been given the spirit of Christ. What he meant by that was we, we don't move in the dimension of this world exclusively. We move in the dimension of the spirit as well. So while we have to go to work and, and live and eat and breathe and sleep and all of the things that make us human, and that's this dimension we are at an advantage, what I often call the unfair advantage over unbelievers that have not experienced the life of God, is that we also know the life of the other dimension. We know what it means to follow the Spirit. Now, in the midst of all of that, we're trying to establish our hearts on the good things of God, and this world is pressing us to establish our identity through the way we look, through how much education we have, through what side of town we live on, through what connections we have, how much money we've earned, how much money we've saved, how much money's in our retirement, whether or not we've dropped 10 pounds or whether our, our kids are in the right school or whether we've got the, the certain job. All these are superficial. They're all externals. We all consider that stuff worldly. However, what we often don't consider worldly, and I think we probably ought to, is that there's an enormous amount of this coming at us from religion that has nothing to do with the world and its system, and yet I still think that the New Testament considers religion as we know it a part of that same system. That's a bit of a disconnect for some because they see the fleshly sinful things as being of the devil and of the world, and then If it's got religion stamped on it or Christianity stamped on it or you put a cross over a building, then we consider, well, that's a different different game. But I don't think so. I think a lot of times we're we're still coming at it from the exact same system. Uh, Let's let the Scripture help open this door for us tonight that I want to go in. I want to read from Hebrews chapter 13. I do a lot of work in Hebrews. I'm doing a lot of writing in Hebrews, from Hebrews, and I've done a lot of study there. Uh, and my my own personal study always seems to circle back to Hebrews. I remember whenever I taught this book in our local church, and it took us over a year to teach the book of Hebrews, and I, about half of those weeks, I would get up and open my my service with a portion of the verse I want to read to you, because I felt like this was really not only what the book of Hebrews is all about, but honestly, what all gospel ministry is all about. Listen to Hebrews 13, 9. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Look at the middle of that verse. It is good that the heart be established by grace. I actually consider Hebrews 13, 9, The verse of the book of Hebrews. This is the one. The author builds a case all the way to this verse in which he has said, let your heart rest, let it be established, let it be foundational, let it be rooted in the grace of God. What would be the opposite then of having a heart established in grace would be to have a heart established in something that's not grace. Anything else that's not grace. But that's too general. We can be more specific. Watch the full verse. Don't be carried about with various and strange doctrine. It's good your hearts be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those that have been occupied with them. I I hope you see bookends. In the middle, your heart's established by grace. But on the ends, you have this injunction. Don't 
be carried away with various and strange doctrine. And then on the backside you have those who've been infatuated with foods, they're not profiting by them, which tells me that the bookends are related. Various and strange doctrines have to do with externals. In this case, food. We'll get into why food in a moment because Hebrews 13, 10, 11, 12 is going to introduce that thought. But for purposes of verse 9, your heart's established in grace. Opposite of that would be various and strange doctrines. So for a lot of people, especially in the message of grace, they come into grace, they come into liberty, and they say things, and I I hear this stuff because I go out a lot and talk to churches and pastors and lay people or whatever, and I get all kinds of thoughts and ideas and questions, but I get this sense from people that we're almost tired of doctrine. You know, it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm tired of trying to deal with doctrine and the depths of doctrine. I think we're actually making a huge mistake there because the entire book of Acts is built on the church coming together and discussing their doctrine. They were always making sure that what they were preaching and what they were believing lined up with the finished work of Jesus. I didn't think we ought to be any different. And so one of the easy ways of deception is strange and various doctrines that blow into our lives. I think these doctrines are counter to our hearts being established in grace. They're the act, actually the opposite of a heart established in grace. And so what doctrines might we be talking about that would keep us from having our hearts established in grace? Now, what I don't believe the author is saying is that this is an interdenominational fight. One of you is right about, let's pick a couple of topics. One of you is right about water baptism, the other one's wrong. One of you is right about church growth, the other one is wrong. No, that's not, that's not the doctrine that the early church had in mind. They're not talking about what I consider piddly stuff between two rival churches, one on one corner, one on the other. No. What the author is telling his audience is your hearts can be established in grace or you can be established in these various and strange doctrines which are obsessed with natural things like food. They're obsessed with the external, or to go back to how we opened tonight, they're obsessed with this dimension, this this world and its structure, not just the unbeliever, but the religious world and its structure, all the things that you do, all the things that you don't do, and, and that obsession de-establishes our hearts. Because I think we all start out with our hearts established in grace. You, not, There's not a person in the room that came to Christ through your performance. You came to Christ by faith. You came to Christ trusting Him, believing Him, receiving His grace. Boom, your heart immediately established in grace. It was only afterwards that various and strange doctrines begin to pull you towards works or towards performance in one way or the other. So Everything that's happened since then has actually been a de-establishment of your heart from grace. It took you from a place of grace into a place of performance or works or law or, or whatever other structure. So this is why I open by saying, if I don't say it, haven't said it enough, I want to say it more. My real heart's desire is that your heart be established in grace. And to do that, we have to deconstruct some stuff. There's, there's really no way to get us back down to the foundation of our hearts being in grace without getting rid of some of the peripherals. Some of this stuff that has caused us so much stress and pain and heartache in trying to live for the Lord because we've become obsessed with some of the the works and some of the, the actions. Go back to that same verse. Various and strange doctrines carry us away. That's the literal Greek phrase. Don't be carried away with various and strange doctrines. It's good your heart be established by grace, and here's not what your heart should be established with. Not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. This, on the surface, if you took this with no context, which you know better than to do, but if you did that and you just read this verse, you would say this is an interesting various and strange doctrine. What kind of people are obsessed with food? I mean... The various and strange doctrines surely aren't just food-related. But remember, the book is to Hebrews, so it's written to Jews who have a heritage and a history. They also have a religion of temple worship. And on that religion of temple worship, uh, the dietary law of Israel is enormous. It's so big that there are certain animals off limits. There are certain ways to cook 
animals. There's certain ways not to eat the meat. There's certain. It's listy. It's 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 uh it's there's a list a mile long, and I want to get into all of it. There's not really there's not really a lot of benefit in establishing your heart and grace in something that's been fulfilled. But what does the verse mean contextually? So the author is telling you, listen. In your old heritage of Judaism, you were obsessed with the externals of your diet, what, how you ate it, what you ate, where you ate, when you ate, even washing of hands. He says, and none of you walked away from that with your heart established in grace. You walked away from that condemned. So all you ever thought about was what you were supposed to do and not do, eat and not eat, how to eat it, how not to eat it. And because you were obsessed with that, your hearts were not established in grace. And, and the author calls that a various and strange doctrine. So taking that from the, 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 its couched context of Hebrews 13 and drop that into our lives today. It's like, if my heart's not established in grace, why is it not? What does that have to do with various foods? Well, maybe, maybe it has nothing to do with food, but it certainly has to do with strange doctrines that take us away from hearts established by grace. So whatever we're doing... That destabilizes the heart of grace, that causes us to focus on self, how hard we are working, how hard we, what, how much effort we're putting forward, is a various and strange doctrine. It might be ministered to us by people from a good place. I'm not condemning the voice. I, I do condemn the words. I don't condemn the voice. It's not my job. The author of Hebrews doesn't say, uh, these guys and gals that are, that are teaching you various and strange doctrines are satanic. They're all of the devil. No, he doesn't need to do that. Just You deal with the doctrine. You let the Father deal with the deliverer of that doctrine. So you really, you only are in, responsible for yourself in this journey, okay? You, you're not responsible to go and try to clean up the church world. Neither am I. It's been a big thing for me to try to overcome is this idea that well, we have to fix this and we really just have to guard our hearts against moving away from a heart established in grace into something that's been influenced by various and strange doctrines. And so if the various and strange doctrines, the obsession with food that we eat, then let's put that in our context and say, listen, if I find a believer whose heart has, is no longer established in grace, what is their heart established in? And every time, and I, Hebrews 13 bears this out, it's going to be established in something they can do. It's going to be established in their performance and the way they do it and how they do it and why they do it. And I think this is swallowing us up. This is drowning believers because we're becoming obsessed with our performance all the while bragging about being a free people. All the while bragging about the grace of God has given us liberty. And then we'll spend the next five days concentrating on all the stuff we did and that we didn't do. So that's one thing for me to sit here and say, well, your heart ought to be established in grace. You don't allow yourself to be influenced by those externals. It's another thing to see where the author of Hebrews goes next. So go from verse 9 into verse 10. Watch this, this turn, which on the surface is going to look like a change of topic. But that's because we're Gentiles, not Jews. So we're going to read it as Gentiles. Then we're going to try to filter it as a Jew might have first century. Verse 10, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The only resemblance between verse 10 and verse 9 is that last word of verse 10, eat. Because in verse 10, he says, We got an altar. It's those that are in the tabernacle don't have a right to eat here. If you go back a verse, you got guys obsessed with food. This is not a food passage. But he is taking a Hebrew-minded Jew, and he's taking them to the tabernacle. And this is what I mean by Gentiles miss this, because we we've never in our lives killed an animal and offered its blood as a sacrifice to God. So we have absolutely no idea what that concept is like. So let me just review with you what the Hebrew audience of Hebrews 13 would have known that a Gentile audience today doesn't know. At the temple... The tabernacle, then the temple. Same rules apply in the tabernacle and the temple. At the temple, the priest would take your sacrifice. You would put your sins effectively. You would lay your hands on it, put your sins into it. And then the priest would kill the sacrifice after inspecting it. He didn't inspect you. He inspected your lamb because you were putting what you have done into your lamb. So you just need your host to be perfect. 
whenever they took the lamb, they would slaughter it, slit its throat, quarter its body. They would take all of the insides, all the guts, and they would take them outside of the temple and they would toss them. In the old days, the Old Testament, when it was the tabernacle, it was as simple as throwing them over the wall. And so then there would be this, and this is gross, but this is, this was the reality, is there would basically be this pile of guts outside of the tabernacle that was representative of all of the waste and filth that was not worthy to burn on the altar. So it got a little more a little more fancy when you get to the temple age. You got Jerusalem and the temple's right in the middle. You didn't just toss guts over the wall in the temple in Jerusalem, but you did end up taking them to oftentimes to a trash dump uh, outside of the city. I'll get into more of that in a moment. But what would happen is the priesthood would offer this lamb up on the altar, and when the fire was done consuming it, what do you do with all this meat? This was the issue. I mean, you got if you've got this steady stream of people coming to the temple, Offering lambs. Some of us have this idea that fire came down and then the whole thing was gone. <laughs> That's not true. We've watched too many movies. That's not what happened. So you, you kept the fire going all of the time. That was part of the priest's job. Is he keeps his fire going at the brazen altar. You put the animal on top of the brazen altar and it burns. I mean, it's a massive barbecue going on. And once the sacrifice was sufficiently cooked until it stopped bleeding, so everything was well done. This was actually a rule in the book of Leviticus is that you didn't eat any of it with blood. When it was finished, what do we do with the animal? The priest could then eat the meat that came off the altar. They were literally taking the meat off the altar and they could just stockpile it. So they would then have as much food as they needed to eat. This was allowable by the priests because they didn't own their own cattle. So their whole lives were built up in the church. Church, that's really the wrong word, but it's familiar to us. Their whole lives were built up in the church, and so they didn't get to own property and cattle and sheep, and so they didn't have access to the things that everybody else in Israel had access to. So to eat off the altar was their privilege. They were able to eat what had been consumed off the altar. This, in turn led Israel to believe there was some sort of power in the meat. That's why you get this New Testament argument. You remember this one where Paul starts dealing with meat offered to idols? This is where heathens were doing the same thing, and they would take the meat off the altar, and they would package it, put it in the market, and you could come and buy meat offered to Zeus. And there was this belief that if you ate meat that had been offered to Zeus, you would get a little bit of Zeus's favor. Now, we, re- we hear that. That's stupid. We go, that, that's dumb. Who believed that? Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what happens whenever you allow yourself to go down that road. You're going to get that branch. And so here's Israel who starts thinking, oh, there's power in that meat. And so the priesthood then are, are these honored, revered guys are eating the meat off the altar. All right? The author of Hebrews... We just read our verse. Don't be carried away with various and strange doctrines. He said, I'd rather your heart be established in grace, not in food. Now you're starting to get a little bit of a glimpse. You go, stop thinking that there is something special that you can get through the natural realm that is greater than a heart established in grace. And he said, and so to qualify that, that's that 10th verse. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. In other words, what you have as a believer, your heart's established in grace, is you have an altar that does not look like the Jewish altar, the brazen altar in the the temple. You have an altar that happened in an entirely different place. Now, the author has yet to reveal what that altar is, so I won't reveal it either. But let's just review and make sure we realize he's countering false doctrine by establishing your hearts in grace. And the false doctrine that he mentions are people obsessed with the externals of religious performance. And he says none of those religious performances is going to do you any good. In fact, you have it better than they have it. Why? Because you have an altar they can't eat off. Let's make sure we find that altar. Verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. After you skin this animal and you quarter it, its body goes on the altar, the priest gets to eat off of that. You got a whole bunch of junk left over. You got, you got wool, you got guts, etc., etc. So you could take the remainder of it. There's a lot of body parts that don't end up on the altar. They would take those and burn them 
outside the camp. This burning was a constant sort of everlasting burning of all the dross, filth, and waste that had been left over at the temple. They took the blood, they took that in, you know what happens. They pour the blood over the altar, and sometimes the Day of Atonement, you're going to take the blood into the great, or to the holy place, most holy place, and you're going to pour the blood over the, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, they're burnt, they burn the bodies outside the camp. Here comes a therefore. This is your transition moment. This is where he hits his stride in verse 12 of Hebrews 13 because he's leading you up to the big Jesus moment. You want your hearts established in grace? You're going to have to do what he told you to do. Uh, Way back in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Your your heart is never going to be established in grace where your eyes aren't looking at Jesus. Where your eyes are looking at you, you're going to be established in your performance. Where your eyes are looking at your past, you're going to be established in your performance. Where your eyes are focused on this dimension, what you say, what you do, what you eat, what you wear, where you go, what you don't, heart's not going to be established in grace. You're going to have to look to Jesus. So watch the turn in verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. All right, so what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't die in Jerusalem. Jesus dies outside of Jerusalem. He doesn't die on an altar at the temple. He dies at the trash dump outside of the city as the complete and perfect sacrifice for the people. Jesus dies in a place separate from the performance of Judaism. So you you cannot establish your heart through faith and grace through any of the formulas of the temple. You're going to have to go outside the camp to do this. There There is a divorcement. That happens in knowing Jesus, that Jesus warned us about. And I think one of our very first sessions together, I actually talked to you about Jesus uh, pulling people away. Almost this isolation that Jesus encouraged that would happen as you follow him, where you would end up in this place where you... uh, I think we even used the text from the Gospels where Jesus talked about you leave your father and your mother... Uh, your enemies be those of your own household. We talked about why that was. But what happens when you follow Jesus is, is there is a severing. There's going to be something that's different. For a Jew, first century, it was enormous because they were basically divorcing Moses. They were leaving behind all the things they had known. They were coming to follow Jesus. You and I don't have that whole follow Moses thing, but we do have the understanding that we come into Jesus. If we're really going to know him, if we're really going to follow him, sometimes we're going to have to go outside the camp. And there's probably people in this room, there's certainly going to be people that listen to this in the future who know that the prompting of the Holy Spirit is pulling them outside the camp because the greatest thing that's going to happen in your life where your hearts are going to be truly established in grace is going to happen outside the camp. It's going to happen outside of this comfort zone. It's going to happen outside of this place. There's going to be a division that takes us away. And Jesus does that. He pulls us out of our works and our performance, and this dimension and its system. And he puts us into a a new place, a place where we are at rest, where our hearts are not established in what we do, but established in him. Therefore, Jesus, so that he might sanctify the people. So that word means set apart. He really makes you holy. Jesus, so that he might make you holy, suffers outside the camp. Jesus is not in the business of, of watching you make yourself holy. The whole purpose of Calvary was so that you could be a set-apart people while the rest of the world goes about establishing its identity on what it does, how much money it makes, how good they are, what they look like. Jesus is dying outside the camp so that everybody that comes in through him will have to come in outside the camp, outside the system, outside the norm, where we'll find true rest. Jesus, to sanctify the people, offers himself outside the camp. Where is Jesus... When he dies, he's at Calvary. Where's Calvary? Outside the gates of Jerusalem. It's literally, he dies outside of the norm. Where is Jesus when he resurrects? Well, he's in the garden tomb, inside Jerusalem, where he provides life. We don't have to stretch too far. I'm not trying to establish some new thing, but I, I, I have this thought. Go with me. Jesus tells the Pharisees that there's a place called Gehenna, hell, a trash dump outside of the walls. 
and that the fire there burns and the worm doesn't die because it's eating the rotten carcasses. Jesus warns of this place. Then Jesus goes outside the camp and he dies in what some would say is a God-forsaken place outside of Jerusalem. And then when he resurrects, he doesn't resurrect out there because your new life is not going to happen out there. He resurrects in a garden tomb. He resurrects in Jerusalem, but for us, does he not resurrect in New Jerusalem? Does he not establish a new city in us so that we die? He suffers our destruction so that we can live his life. Really what happens when you meet him is you go there. You go to this place where everything else is cut off. And you resurrect in this place where you're in a brand new city, you're in a brand new garden, you're in a brand new world. Jesus literally drops heaven into your earth. So many of us, after we get converted, we become new creations. We spend so much time trying to establish ourselves in this system. Our hearts running away from us. Our minds stressed out. We're trying to establish ourselves through our performance. There's no performance there that's worthy of a heart established in grace. There's nothing left for us. I mean, if Jesus suffers out there, we suffer out there with him. I want to add to it from another passage because Hebrews, as great and as wonderful as it is, I want to see the Apostle Paul's edition. So I'm going to go to Galatians 4, and I want to read to you some familiar verses about the two covenants. There's a dual covenant theology that Paul presents in Galatians 4 that basically says there's an old covenant and there's a new covenant. Now, for purposes of covenantal teaching, you're going to sit under covenant teachers that are going to list off the multiple covenants. They're going to throw in Noah. They're going to throw in Abraham. They're going to throw in David, etc., etc. I'm not saying those aren't cult covenants, but Paul, the ultimate covenant teacher, ignores all but two for purposes of this illustration. And he even he even calls one old and one new. One there's one and there's two. And and for purposes of his illustration, there's Moses and there's Jesus. There's an old covenant and there's a new covenant. And Paul does something amazing in Galatians 4. He actually talks about both covenants without mentioning uh, some of the specifics that we normally associate with covenant. Instead, Paul does an allegory. He takes an Old Testament story, he applies truth, he creates something that had never been created before. For us, we've seen it for 2,000 years, Galatians 4, big deal. If you were reading Galatians 4 for the first time, almost 2,000 years ago, and you have a Jewish heritage, or even if you don't have a Jewish heritage, it doesn't matter, you've never heard anything like this. You've never heard anybody take this Old Testament story of Sarah and Hagar and relay it, relate it through the idea of the dual covenant system. And you've never heard it produced the way Paul's going to produce it. Galatians chapter 4, let's read verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. He who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, He who was of the free woman was born through promise. Let's go through our Old Testament stories again. Who are the two sons? Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael is born by Hagar. Isaac is born by Sarah. Ishmael is not a son of promise. Isaac is a son of promise. He had to be a son of promise. His mom was 90 years old. She can't have kids. It's going to take a miracle. Ishmael's mom is Hagar. Having children is no big deal for her. She's in the prime of her life. So it doesn't take a miracle. And so we have Paul makes a contrast. He says one is is the son of a bondwoman, the other one is the son of a free woman. 24, which things are symbolic. Now, up until this moment, they had never been symbolic in anybody's theology. So Paul takes them and says, look, here's what the new covenant is all about. These are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now here's the reason I'm reading this. What does this have to do with Hebrews 13? Watch this verse. This Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Did you see what he did? Old covenant, he said, 
corresponds with Sinai, there's the law, and it corresponds with Jerusalem, natural Jerusalem, which now is, which is in bondage with her children. What's happening in Jerusalem in the time of Galatians? The temple, sacrifice, it's still going on. Jesus has died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven, but we still got Jewish sacrifices going on in the temple. The Apostle Paul says, what's going on in there is an obsession with the natural, and it's a son of the bondwoman, and it's a son of slavery, and you're not going to be free if that's where you're partaking. Put this idea with the Hebrews 13.9 idea. I write this to you so that your hearts be established in grace, that you not be carried away with various strange doctrines who are obsessed with foods. They don't eat from your altar. They're obsessed with their foods, but they don't eat from your altar because they eat from the altar of performance in Jerusalem. And you eat outside the camp. You eat at a whole different place. When Paul writes it, he says there's a place called Jerusalem that is in bondage with her children. And if you're in that system working, you're probably going to have to work from a place of bondage. You're not going to be able to work from a place of liberty. You're going to be a slave to something or somebody, and your heart is not going to be established in the grace of God because you're so obsessed with doing or you're so obsessed with not doing. I mean, we're so big into not doing, we can't even help ourselves as someone says to us, what do you guys believe at your church? Almost every Christian responds with five things we don't believe in. I mean, we'll say things like, well, we don't believe in doing this. We don't believe in doing this. That wasn't even the question. I just simply asked what you believe in, but it's so much easier for you to tell me what you believe by giving me five things you don't believe. Because we we don't know how to just speak a heart established out of grace. We have to go down the list of stuff we don't do (laughs) or that we don't agree with or that we don't believe in. And these are all various and strange doctrines birthed from a place called Jerusalem instead of birthed from a place in our spirit. Reading on. Galatians 4.27 Now there's going to be a little quoting. This is actually a quote from Isaiah. Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout. You who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. And we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Watch this verse. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but children of the free. Just as Jesus goes outside the walls to die, I'm telling you, there's going to have to be some casting out that goes on in our own life. This is not a purge sermon where you need to go through your life and check box this, get rid of this. No, there's going to have to be a purging of how we view ourselves and some of the activities and things that we're calling the faith, but they're really just ways to validate ourselves in the eyes of God. Some of this stuff, bond woman and her children have got to go. Our hearts are established in grace. They are not established in what we do or don't do. And I know that in the midst of this, there are always going to be great challenges. There are always going to be great questions. There's always going to be those who say, well, how do I handle this? Or how do I handle that? What am I supposed to do in this scenario? You should follow the Spirit. Paul senses the same thing. If you'll read this chronologically in Galatians, when you get into chapter 5, what does he talk about? Walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. Why does he do that? Because he knows that he's dealing with an audience that's struggling to get over their Hagar hangover. They've been doing performance for so long they don't know anything else. And he's like, well, how do we get out of this mess? How do we get away from the Jerusalem it now is? How do we stop with the various and strange doctrines? I don't know how to go cold turkey. Or maybe I can't go cold turkey. Maybe I can't do it financially. Maybe I can't do it spiritually. So how do I do it? So Paul writes the fifth chapter of Galatians. Then he says, we walk in the Spirit. And as As we walk in the Spirit, we're going to stop fulfilling the lusts of our flesh. In other words, the more that we establish our hearts in grace, the more that we walk in the Spirit, the more that we're going to see some of this stuff getting shed off. We're going to start getting rid of the bondwoman and her son. We're going to move. I'm I'm mixing metaphors here. I know. I'm, I'm mixing Hebrews 13 and Galatians 4. We're going to move outside the camp. We're going, to, we're going to get outside the walls of Jerusalem, or to use the Galatians 4 metaphor. We're going to kick Hagar and her kid out of our lives. We're not going to have any room for this performance-based mentality in which I establish my own holiness based upon my ability to give or do or what I don't do or what I don't say or where I don't go or what. All of this stuff, 
will not define me and my righteousness anymore. This is not to say that stuff won't come out of us as we're believers, that grace won't produce. My goodness, grace is the greatest producer. Grace teaches us. Titus 2, 11 and 12, grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. There's no teacher like the grace of God. But a heart not established in grace is going to be established in something. What is it that we're so established in if not the grace of God? This is a process that needs to begin immediately. Immediately in our lives. We need to begin to take inventory of the things that we've put our confidence in and called it faith. But in reality, it is just a prop up. It's something by which we measure and have a metric to say, am I, am I closer to the Lord now than I was six months ago or a year ago? And that is a religious construct, that whole closer to the Lord business. Most of that's emotionally attached anyway. We only, we only determine if we're closer based upon whether or not we get more out of praise and worship or whether or not we get goosebumps on the back of our neck when we hear a certain sermon or a certain song. None of that has to do with proximity. It could have to do with the temperature in the room or what you ate before you came together. None of it has anything to do with whether or not you've drawn in closer to Him. You've been given all things freely. You operate and function in a place called faith and your heart is established in grace. And the only thing bothering our proximity to the Lord is we keep running back into old Jerusalem and living with Hagar and the bond son and performing. We're like Samson grinding somebody else's corn, wondering why our hearts aren't established in grace. And our rest is in the knowledge of who we are in Christ, what he's done for us, who he is and, and what that makes us, not what we can do for him, what we can say for him, where we can go for him. And don't buy the lie. This is a lie of the enemy that... Too much of this grace will produce a people who are lazy and do nothing for the Father. I'm trying to overcome that foolishness every day of my life. We travel across the world telling people about the grace of God. It's the last thing in my mind is to say nothing to people about the life that could be theirs in Christ. Why would we go backwards when we have so many good reasons to go forward? Why would we set idle on this amazing information? When there are so many people, so many voices trumpeting works and performance yet again and again and again. And here's what I found. You can't hear this too much. You cannot hear too much that your heart needs establishing grace. You'll hear it now. You need to hear it again. Your heart established in God's grace. What does God think of me? What has Jesus done for me? If he died outside the camp, I probably ought to be out there with him. Nothing in this system has anything for me. There's nothing left to me upon my, through my own performance. The divorce you're seeing in Hebrews 13 and the divorce you're seeing in Galatians 4 is final. We have left natural Jerusalem and all of her trappings. We're no longer on that altar. We're no longer eating its food. We are now consuming something at a different place. And the author of Hebrews bragged and said, you have an altar to eat off of that they don't know anything about. Don't let that system make you feel inferior because you don't participate in all of the things by which This is what Hebrews is saying. That priest in that temple is going to make you feel like an idiot because you don't eat the same meat off his altar. But he says, you have an altar to eat off of he doesn't know anything about. You have a man named Jesus who died outside the camp. And your heart is established in that knowledge and in that truth and in that grace. There is nothing in the world greater than that. There is nothing in the world better than resting in that knowledge, just trusting in that. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for this room and I pray for anyone that might be listening. Just to let this, this, seed, this seed drop down into good soil and go to work. Father, thank you so much for this word and for this chance to speak into the lives of your kids. They're your children. They're your sheep. And you go to no uncertain lengths. You, 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 will, you will go to no, no, there's no measure as to where you will stop to hunt us down with favor. So thank you for finding us tonight. Teach us individually, every single one of us who have individual liberty and who we are in Christ, teach us what it means to come outside the camp, to follow you, to go be where you are. And whatever that means that we got to get rid of this bond woman and her children, teach us how to do that as well. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.